Hey, uh, hi, I'm Michael. Uh, I want to thank IGN Entertainment and I want to thank Kazing and Marikana and everybody for inviting me to put this on for you guys. Um, so let's begin. Um, obviously, my website is michaelatulip.com. Uh, at michaelatulip is the uh, Twitter handle. Okay, the hashtag this evening is going to be HTML5MD. Okay, for microdata. All right. Now, so why the semantic web, and uh, you know why is it important? Uh, the semantic web is a term coined by Tim Berners-Lee. Um, and you know, I think we all know it's, 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 it's the web of linked data. And um, it, it potentially has the, the possibility of creating some pretty awesome applications in the near future. So um, there's been a lot of debate around it. But um, the case is, once we have the semantic web in place, it'll be a lot easier for machines to understand the web and the information on the web. And we can you know, produce some pretty awesome things from that sort of thing. Here's a quote from Tim Berners-Lee. The semantic web is not a separate web, but an extension of the current one, in which information is given well-defined meaning, better enabling computers and people to work in cooperation. Okay, and that is actually an image of Tim Berners-Lee uh, that I found that looked really awesome. Uh, so I thought I'd put that up there. Um, so basically, the semantic web is a web of data. Uh, it's going to be a machine-readable web, so computers will actually be able to understand and work with the information uh, and how things are related. It's going to enable automated agents, and it's going to allow us to find, share, and combine easier. Um, we have RDF OWL microformats, which are all pretty standardized at this point. And, um, arrives microdata with the HTML5 uh, spec. And uh, there's a lot of reasons why they went with microdata. Uh, and RDFA has not made it into the HTML5 spec. And we'll go into that later on. Um, so why do we want to use microdata? It's easy to implement. It's similar to a DOM or JavaScript object, and it feels native to HTML. Um, and it also has a DOM API that browsers can actually implement, um, and very easily. Whereas something like RDFA is very hard uh, to parse in that way. So I want to get straight in the markup. I know. A lot of these meetups, you know, it's kind of review and it gets boring or whatever. Um, let's get into the, the markup right away. All right. Um, first of all, you have the item scope and item prop attributes. Um, I want to say here, you can, the, the beauty of HTML5 microdata is that the item scope and the item prop attributes can be used in basically every HTML element. So you don't need to worry about, can it be in this tag or can it be in that tag? It can be in all the tags. Um, each name value pair is a property, and properties generally have values that are strings, and they consist of group name value pairs, which are called items. And as you can see here, some basic code, um, you start with the item scope to basically enable the system to know that, hey, this is something to look at. Item prop name tells you the name. Here, obviously, I put it in the header tag. Um, item prop is you know, relating as well to the description, the nationality, and uh, the image in the code. Properties can have dates and times. So um, it's very simple to mark up the uh, the date and time of events or anything of that sort and make it machine readable in such a way that's so easy and native to HTML that it really takes no code at all to add in. You can see here you start with the item scope, obviously, at the beginning. Then you have the name and the time, which, you know, item prop there is birthday. And um, you can see there that's 
basically how it's done. We can have multiple properties with the same name. So basically, you, for instance, here we have the item scope, uh, the available strains, and you will see that it says item prop strain twice. Okay, because basically we can use it multiple times, you know, and it wouldn't make a difference whatsoever. Properties that are not descendants of the element. Um, this is interesting, but there's a way to mark up with microdata that things are not related as well. So um, you can see here the item ref is used in that case, where basically you can, you know, kind of say, hey, this is not related to this, even though it's in the same scope, basically. Um, and that's, that's really good, and you know, it's, it's pretty easy to implement. Um, multiple properties can be included in a single item. So um, you, we can include multiple properties. And you can see here, favorite color, favorite fruit, you can include in the same item prop, and that would be orange. Or, you know, and obviously there's different cases where that might be important. Um, now the really, the important stuff here is microdata in context. And, um, you know, the way we give context is by loading vocabularies. Uh, and the way we do that is through the item type. And as you can see here, we, start, we do the item scope, then it goes into item type, then you link off to the vocabulary, okay? And this would be, um, you can make your own vocabulary. You can link off to other vocabularies. It, it wouldn't make a difference, basically, um, what vocabulary you use here, but obviously you want it to be related in the same scope. So. Um, you have the name, the description, and the image here of, um, as we put here, the strain OG Kush. It's got all the information that the search engines or anyone are, are, is going to need, um, you know, to to read this information and you know produce some pretty awesome stuff in the search ed search results. So we have global identifiers for items, which is basically voto, vocabs, and we can give something like, for instance, an ISBN number, uh, you know, a URL that links it in so it, it knows basically that, hey, this ISBN number is this because the item type is, you know, basically a global URL with a loaded vocabulary in it that can be used. So obviously everything in the item scope has to relate to, you know, each other. Of course, unless, you know, you, um, you want to define your own vocabulary. And um, the reason you would define your own vocabulary is because what's available isn't good enough. Uh, for instance, I work with the medical cannabis industry and there's really not a vocabulary yet for us to use to, you know, pull off of. So this is something that I'm working on, um, but basically you can also, well, you want to reuse existing libraries as much as possible. So um, we, we don't necessarily have to invent everything, um, but you want to make sure that you match up with other vocabs so you don't have to create the same thing. And here, um, you can see I've basically linked to the vocabulary at the top, which is strains and the OG Kush type. And I've listed for the machines, if you will, the name, the description, and also colors that are associated with it, and also an image that is associated with it. So it's it's basically uh, possible to define a whole new vocabulary around a subject that might not be currently available on the, on the web. And uh, this is one example where in the near future, 
hopefully there will be a vocabulary to pull from for the medical cannabis industry. Um, here's an example of exactly what the vocabulary would look like if you were to create it. You would have a property and you would have a value. Um, obviously you can see in certain instances there are links there because I'm linking off to global identifiers that have already been created so I don't have to reinvent them. Um, but in other cases that might not be the case. So really the vocab specs for microdata are all at data-vocabulary.org and really that is where you will find all the information you need to create your web apps or anything along those lines. And it's got the event, organization, person, product, review, review aggregate, breadcrumb, offer, and offer aggregate. So we're going to start off with an event. All right, and I've, this is a little small for everyone to see here, but basically the vocabulary that you would link to is data-vocabulary.org slash event. And that's all you would need to do. And all of the properties that you see off on the left-hand side are mark, or you can mark them up with the item prop attribute. So um, let me give an example here. And this is, this is obviously um, not very easy to see, but you can see I've kind of tried to highlight the data vocabulary slash event being in the section tag at the very top. And um, that's kind of stating, hey, in this section, this is going to be about an event. And um, you'll see there the photo, item prop photo is highlighted, also item prop URL for the event, the start date, the end date, the location, the street address, the geolocation, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, he's asking uh, what, other, what other aspects will microdata affect in the near future other than search engines, basically. So, and in that way, it's going to enable us to create kind of our own search engines in a way, where basically we can scan the web in however manner we want to scan the web scan the data off the web, seeing it perhaps in the format we want to see it, as opposed to having to see some awfully designed website or something along those lines. Um, basically, it enables us to take all the information of the web and you know, output it in any way we want to output it. So if we want to output it in graphs or images or however we want to do it, it's going to be possible. The only way... Uh, we can do that currently is by adding context and adding the semantics to the pages. Uh, you know, in the future that might be different. All right, well, you can see here, uh, this is the page that's actually being marked up currently. All right, and uh, currently the Green Cross is holding a Japanese earthquake fundraiser uh, on April 12th at 9, uh, 9, I'm sorry, 7.30, it shouldn't say. Yeah, 7.30 to 9.30. Um, and basically, if we can see in the, uh, keynote here, basically, um, you know, everything here is listed. You have the start date, the end time, everything. So, and it, it's not hard at all to include in the page to basically make that machine readable. Now, how do you test this data? Okay, and that's kind of where, you know, we come to a point where HTML5 microdata is really not implemented currently. Um, by anyone or any major CMS or anything along those lines. So the only real support is Google. And obviously, being a search marketing person, I do what Google does. Um, and generally, this tool is really where it's at. So if you'll see here, the, um, the data that's being pulled um, if I put in the URL, you'll actually be able to see down below that it says Japanese Earthquake Fundraiser Event, the date, the organization it's associated with, and kind of stand out a little bit in the search engines. Um, so uh, basically from a web usability standpoint, 
this is important. You'll see here is what the extracted data is on the page that Google has actually pulled. And you'll see that immediately they, they say type, and it's the event type. It pulled the photo. It pulled the URL of the event. It pulled the summary, the start date, the end date. It Im an embedded location item, or, I'm sorry, uh, nested, and um, a description, the event type. And then the nested data here is the organization, which is you know, San Francisco Americans for Safe Access. And there's two other nested items here, which um, is the address of the location, which you can see the data vocabulary.org slash address. And then down here, the nested item three is the data vocabulary.org slash geo is the actual geolocation of the event. And obviously, this, this does something for the search engine because you can see the data and how it might look to someone pulling it up. But feasibly, with an application, you could extract this kind of data and really have a good idea of what is on the page, whereas before, that wasn't really possible. Um, next, we're going to move on to the organization, um, which there's only five properties, name, URL, address, telephone, and the geolocation. And um, here we're going to use, um, you know, basically an example code from a website that I did where I'm trying to list all of the dispensaries in San Francisco. And currently, I think there's about 24 of them. So um, you'll see that I immediately create the scope of the organization. Um, and I list the name, the address, um, and the phone number, and also the geolocation coordinates and the URLs of that organization. Um, so, if we actually go to the site, um, we can see kind of what, you know, what exactly the data is, you know, what the human sees here, okay? So, the human sees this fantastic web application. They don't even know what's going on on the back end for the machines, and if we go over and we go to the uh, rich snippet, um, currently, unfortunately, Google does not support organizations and rich snippets, but we can still see all the data that's being pulled from the 23 dispensaries. So for the first time in history, we have a complete list marked up in microdata of all the cannabis dispensaries in San Francisco. And, you know, I don't really know what, what Google can do with this information. This is more or less something that would be good for an application. Maybe somebody who wanted to pull the data from the page to create a, a map or whatever of all of the dispensaries. So um, basically, you can see I've marked up every single one. There's quite a bit. So. Um, there's a lot more dispensaries than McDonald's or Burger King or anything like that. So if you'll notice, you don't see those around very much. <laughs> Basically, in order to get this recognized by Google, you're supposed to submit it to Google. Okay, and there's actually a URL for that. And uh, you know, you're supposed to let them know, basically, because they don't, they don't go out searching for this kind of stuff. Basically, we have to submit this to them and say, hey, take a look at what we did here. And obviously, they give us feedback if something wasn't wrong, was wrong, or you know, whatever, whatever would happen. I think that's kind of how it works. So you do have to submit the site or the URL that has the rich snippet data on it. There's, uh, you know, that's easy to do. And um, but right now, they don't support organizations, unfortunately, and the rich snippets. But that'll probably change soon. You'll see addresses or whatever you see down at the bottom. So. Um, but we'll move on to person, and actually, Peter Lovers, who just asked the question, he's going to feature in this one. Um, basically, um, you know, we have a bunch of properties, name, nickname, photo, title, 
role, URL, affiliation, friend, contact, acquaintance, and address. Now obviously I'm not gonna list Peter Lover's address here, but I, I have um, basically marked up uh, a page and you can see I start by announcing it's a person, um, the name of the person, uh, he's into ultra running and I got a photo. I put his title as the senior director of HTML5 documentation and training at Kazing. And um, I even wrote a little description, which, uh, you know, makes him look very, very good, I hope. And, um, you know, I've also even included a URL here to his blog post. Now, um, when we pull up the page in the rich snippet tool, um, you'll see um, they've pulled out the data that he's the senior director of HTML5 documentation and training from Kazin Corporation. So that's basically the extent of how Google's supporting it, but you can see that they've actually pulled quite a bit of data from the page and um, including the title, description, his URL, and so forth. And um, also, there's some organization data at the bottom as well. But um, basically, um, this is easy to do. Everyone should have a marked up page like this. And Peter will have it shortly. So very good. So we're going to move on to product, which is obviously important for a variety of reasons. Uh, making money is obviously why people get hired most of the time. Uh, so we have brand, category, description, name, image, review, identifier, and um, I don't even know what that says. It says offer details, that's right. So here we have an example product, and um, it's also going to include a nested review and a nested offer, so it's kind of like the full scope here. But basically, I announce at the top, it's data vocabulary, it's a product. Uh, the brand is going to be the Green Cross, and the name is going to be Purple Urkel, which I don't know, who's, is there any Purple Urkel fans here? No? Woo! Yeah, all right, that's good. Um, all right, so I've linked off to the image of that, which is, of course, you know, a very beautiful image. And um, I've listed a little description of the strain as well, and um, you know, which category it's in. So I've said it's in cannabis, it's in indica, and uh, you know, basically let the machines know, hey, this is, this is pretty good, because you'll see here, um, obviously I put the product number, which is 420 conveniently, um, and then I've listed the review aggregate here for this product, which of course I've listed as five stars with a hundred reviews. All right, so you know that's that's that, and then below that you have the nested offer, which uh, I link to, and then you'll see I have the price listed, when the sale begins, when the sale ends, okay, who's the seller at the sale. Um, if the condition of the item is new or used, and also if it's available. So if we click over here to the Rich Snippet tool, we can actually see um, what's going to be produced by the, just that data there. Okay? And you'll see it produced the five stars, which of course stands out. It says it's in stock, and it's only $30. So, you know, that sounds like a pretty good deal. And uh, if you'll see, I basically down below here, you can all the data here and um, the nested items and so forth. So even though it might not all show up in Google, there is a lot more data there that can be pulled. Okay, so um, you know there, there's definitely the possibility to make some awesome applications with that. We'll move on to the review. All right, which is pretty simple. This is kind of like your Yelp situation or whatever you're dealing with. You're gonna need to mark that up. All right, so item reviewed, rating, reviewer, 
you know, date review, the description, and the summary. Those are pretty much what you got to work with here. And uh, you'll see I've marked it up. Obviously, I've linked off to the review vocabulary and, um, you know, the item reviewed and who the reviewer was and all that stuff. So let's go straight to the Rich Snippet tool and see how Google took it. And uh, you'll see this, uh, the green cross here obviously is being reviewed by the stoned prophet. Um, and the date is April 2010. So all that data is right there. Okay, so, and you can see down below, they even have a summary, the description he wrote, all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, it's, there's a lot more data than what Google's presenting here. Um, next, we're gonna go on to the review aggregate, which is obviously more of a summary of all the reviews, as opposed to just the single review by the Stone Prophet. So, we have item reviewed, rating, count, votes, summary. Um, obviously, you link off to that vocabulary at the top. Uh, the item reviewed is the green cross. They even let you put a photo on this one, so we linked off to the photo for the logo. Um, the rating is the vocabulary for the rating is there, and uh, you can see it goes down to the votes, which is another part of the vocabulary. Now, let's put this in the rich snippet tool. All right, so you'll see here they've got a fantastic rating according to this uh, tool. So 200 reviews, five stars, um, and they, there's even an image there. Obviously, it should be, you know, it should be custom for this uh, system, but nonetheless, you can see that a logo was actually pulled up there uh, on the search result page, which obviously is going to draw people's attention to it. Um, and, you know, uh, you can see the data, very simple, the votes, the count, you know, what the average is. I put 10 out of 10, you know, because obviously I have reasons for that. Next, we're going to move on to the breadcrumbs, which I don't know if you guys know about breadcrumbs, but, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty important. It looks really good at the bottom of your website on the search results. So. Um, you know, there's only three properties. Title, URL, and child. And it's very, very simple to implement. So everyone should do it. Um, you can see I'm basically breadcrumbing for this uh, Japan fundraiser we're having. And um, we'll pull it up in the rich snippet tool here. And you'll actually see uh, breadcrumbs right here. They could click on that, they can click on this, or they can just go right in and RSVP right away, right out of the search results. No one had to go to the website and wait for it to load or any of that. So, you know, it basically makes it a lot more convenient for the user for a variety of reasons. And, you know, I think it, it works. So, that's kind of the breadcrumb scene, right? The data vocabulary offer, we kind of already went over. It was in slide 27, which, you know, all these slides are gonna be posted so you guys can review them. And, you know, basically you've got the price, the currency, you know, what, how long the price is valid until um, the seller, the condition, the availability, the offer URL, the identifier, and, uh, you know, the item offered itself. So, next you have the offer aggregate, okay? and. Um, this is obviously an uh, aggregate of all your offers. It's not, um, not just a single one. And uh, the property is low price, high price, currency, offer count, condition, availability, offer URL, identifier, and item offered. Here I have an example product offer aggregate. So it's basically got the best of both worlds here. All right. So. I start with the product, which this time we're going to go with the Green Cross's Blue Dreams, which is great. I'm going to link off to an image of it, and then I've got the review right there, aggregate, basically saying, you know, based on five reviews that this place is such and such stars, 
you know, it's, it's pretty simple. Um, and then the offer details below, uh, you can list, you know, low price, high price, the currency, that kind of thing. And then the magic happens in the search results. Okay, as you'll see, um, the 500 five star reviews are right here. Uh, and also you see the price range of the product, which is 35 to 275. And um, you can see the, the data pulled, the vocabularies that have been called, and how that all kind of mashes up in Google's mind anyway. Next, we're gonna talk a little bit about SEO, and obviously we've gone over this a little bit already, um, but um, you know, I wanna welcome you guys to the machine, okay? Because basically, it's coming, it's becoming that right now. So if you guys don't jump on board, you're gonna be left behind, it's not gonna be fun. So basically, we want everything to be machine readable for a variety of reasons. Um, for SEO reasons, it would mean that the search engines can extract the data and do stuff with it as you've been seeing all evening. Um, we can show more data. We can show better data in the search results. And you know, humans that benefit also because we can actually access these applications which, is, which pulls that data. So, uh, and also we were going over some of the web usability benefits. The stuff is right there in the search results. They don't even have to go to the website. So, um, and better search results. So, you know, that should be important. I don't know if you guys are, you know, aware, but people were complaining about Google having a lot of spam in it, uh, but, you know, hopefully they'll resolve that with, you know, implementations like this. So, a little bit about Google's algorithm. Uh, it's very hard to be ahead of them, but, they're stupid if they don't include machine readable data higher in the results, okay? So basically, if they're not doing it yet, they're gonna do it soon, so you probably wanna get on board before the algorithm changes, you know, that kind of thing. Um, it's gonna be a web of people, places, and things, plus relationships, so um, it's very important we all link together with the global data cloud and these vocabularies and so forth. Um, I think you're going to have, you know, them ranking you higher because they know that they have the right data and they know they have it in context. So basically, if anyone from Google is here or whatever, you know, basically you guys need to make sure you put this in your algorithm soon because, you know, it's, it, it'll help everyone out, I have a feeling. When to and when not to use microdata, all right, and I put two galaxies crashing together because there's a little bit of conflict around this whole situation. Um, not everything works in microdata. Uh, certain things, uh, RDF is still a better solution. So, um, you know, limitations include not being able to use a blank node as an object, and you can't express RDF triples using data types or XML literals. Okay, and that's, that's pretty big. So, it's not good for all use cases, but for most of the, the simple case, cases, it's, it's very much uh, where we should go because it's native. Um, RDF triples can, however, be expressed by using the about type to give the subject of the name value pair. And um, I've basically put up a, a code from the dev W3 where they have implemented RDF inside of microdata. Um, and it's obviously, it's a, it looks a little bit more complex than microdata does, um, but like I was saying, in certain instances, you might need to use RDF. So, you know, there's a variety of ways you can work around it. I've also, there's an example from Philip Hagenstedt uh, down below of the FOF and how you might uh, do FOF inside of microdata. So it's not, uh, it's not out of the realm of possibilities. Um, they have in the spec given everything you need to convert microdata into RDF algorithmically. So I'm gonna refer you guys over to section 5.2 on that link. Uh, 
I didn't do it, but I assume it's easy to accomplish because they have the whole thing written out step by step on how to do it. Um, so if there was ever a need or a want to extract the microdata from the page and export it as RDF, they have everything already done so you can just follow it step by step, basically, and uh, it's not too difficult. Um, you know, we can also turn microdata to JSON, all right, which is JavaScript object notation. Uh, and I put an awesome little graph here. I think that's something to do with Ruby as well. Um, but basically, we can extract microdata to a JSON form. And uh, it's a simple algorithm to implement. Um, the result must be an empty object. Uh, we have to let items be an empty array. And when node in node, you always have to check for that top level item. Okay, so, um, and the, the benefit of microdata, this is one of the big benefits, is that it's so much easier to convert to JSON than RDFA. Okay, uh, RDFA, very difficult apparently. I haven't done it, but that's what I've heard. So um, basically I've listed here the whole algorithm. It's just literally like 10 steps. Um, you implement this, I've linked off to the top, and you can extract all the data off the page right into a JSON form. So not difficult at all to accomplish. Microdata and RDFA, has some controversy around it. Um, basically, RDFA didn't make it into the HTML5 spec. And I say yet, because it's not completed yet, so we don't know if it's gonna make it in, but my assumption is it's not gonna make it in because there's too much fighting going on. So um, it's probably not gonna make it. Uh, the argument is triples can't be expressed in HTML, okay, and that it's not feasible. So, you know, there's a good case to have it, but there's also a very good case against it. And basically, a solution has been drawn up kind of similar in the way that XHTML uh, was handled, where there's an RDFA uh, implement and an XHTML implement and how they work together in a paper on that. So what might end up being the solution here is HTML5 spec and then an RDFA spec on how to embed RDFA in HTML5. But I don't think that it's going to actually make the spec. Um, microdata was meant to be used in place of RDFA because it's native. So the RDF people were not happy at all when that started happening. I can guarantee you that. And that's why they've been fighting to put it in HTML5 because they feel like they're going to be defunct. It's going to be like, the nail in the coffin for the RDF community or RDFA. Um, the good thing about RDFA, it's been tested a hell of a lot more than microdata has. So, um, and it also has real working systems like Drupal implementing the technology right now. So it's used, it's tested. Um, there's a variety of reasons RDFA is very good. Um, and this, you know, these in, this infighting that's been going on has really been affecting the adoption of semantic technologies because people in the know are basically taking a wait and see approach. Let's see how they work this out. Um, and they're really, you know, not implementing it. So, especially microdata. So we're seeing very little implementation of this because of that. And uh, everyone's kind of waiting and seeing, okay, what are they gonna do about RDFA? And, you know, basically Google is like, the core of microdata and it spreads from there, all right? So they're like the big supporters of it. Um, you know, RDFA or microdata? Well, it didn't make it in HTML5. We pretty much say that at this point. Um, there's a quote from a guy at Opera there. Uh, HTML is not a triple store. Um, RDFA began in the now defunct XHTML 2.0, which has been canceled, so, you know, oh well. Um, for certain cases which microdata will not solve your problem, such as those discussed earlier, you should implement RDFA instead because you should use native HTML5 when you can. All right? You shouldn't be having, if it's a simple thing like an event, you shouldn't have to go and use uh, a different technology. You should just use HTML5 to do it. 
uh, and that's kind of it's 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 going to be a lot faster and a variety of other things. So, where do we go from here with microdata? And I put you know obviously we had the nuclear explosion that was you know pretty dramatic. Now we have the opposite. Um, so basically, we want peace, we want harmony, we want the RDF and the microdata people to come together and everybody to be happy. Okay, that that would be the goal. Okay, so let's relax a little bit. All right. The HTML5 spec is coming to a close very soon. I don't know if you guys get emails from them, but I do, and it's, I don't know if it's on the verge of annoying, but I get them like late at night and at random times, and if you haven't turned off your you know, sound thing, it can be really annoying. Um, so, you know, we know microdata is in the spec, so we can start implementing it. RDFA might not make it, but, you know, Basically, we can assume that there's going to be a paper written on how to implement RDFA in HTML5 after the spec has been written. Um, I've linked off to the overview of the whole spec, which is great. Ian Hickson over at Google, he's in control. I listed his email here. If you guys have any direct questions you want to ask Ian, he's probably, I've emailed with him, so he's probably the guy you want to talk to. He's the true spec creator. Um, and you know, I also linked off to all the technical reports on the document. And of course, Yoda here enjoying himself. Here's some of the resources I used, uh, which you know, obviously datavocabulary.org is the primary one. I, you know, you can feasibly see how you could link off to a different vocabulary. It wouldn't be um, all that difficult, but you know, Google supports this one, so I, I pretty much am with them at this point uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, linked off to the testing tool and some of the blogs about the controversy between RDFA and microdata and um, the spec, uh, and also about rich snippets uh, and introducing rich snippets. And all these links here at Google at the bottom are going to take you to that page. You need to submit the uh, data to Google with. So basically, they're, you know, it'll say, do you have something to submit? You just hit submit, and they can then look at the data. And they might, might, they don't always, but they might put it in the search results. Okay? And uh, you know, that is always a good thing. That's, that's the presentation. So if you guys have any questions, uh, this, is, this is the time to do it, I suppose. You were basically saying, what are the state of the options here? You know, we've got micro formats, we've got, we've got RDF, we've got microdata. Um, you know, which is better? Well, micro formats have a lot of problems, okay? Um, I think they utilize the class attribute a lot, which can become a problem when you're trying to parse the data. So, um, and it has like an, I, I, Microformats can be really good for certain use cases, but they're not good for seriously complex situations at times because they have too many classes and you know it can get really confusing. Um, RDF is very complicated. Uh, you j basically, a lot of the people working in the industry I know are like ontologists and brilliant PhDs and so forth. So, and when they all get together and have a good time, I mean, they come up with these super boring documents and, you know, it's, it's not fun. Um, so RDF is, you know, it's kind of, I don't know, I wouldn't call it, it's, it's hard, right? It's not easy uh, and it's not easily adoptable by the majority of web developers. Whereas something like microdata is easy, okay? It's native to HTML. There's nothing really new you have to learn. Um, uh, it, but like I said, it's not good for certain use cases. If you need a blank note or you, know, you need certain things that RDF has, you're going to have to use it. But in most cases, like products and reviews, I mean, we're talking about like 90% of the web, like, you know, you, you don't need anything but microdata at this point. And that's kind of where I'm saying it's native. Yes. He's asking what elements can't it be used in? And I basically have not found anything yet that has given me an error or thrown an error to the Google Rich Snippet tool. So, um, you know, you can use it in an A tag, any tag. It doesn't matter what tag it is. So basically, I haven't found it yet, but I'm sure someone will eventually. He's asking, uh, he's basically saying, hey, you know, in the rich snippet data, we see a lot of, uh, you know, flowery sentences, especially in the descriptions and so forth. And basically, 
let's just say that you can't, we can't parse that easily yet, you know, and make sense of it, but at least we know it's a description of this item. And, you know, so basically, um, I don't know, you know, how, uh, how, that's a lot more in depth, but basically this is the start where basically we at least know, hey, this is the item's name, this is the description, here's the reviews. We can do a lot with that data. Um, certainly, if we could take all the data and the descriptions and everything and produce like whole new documents and stuff, that would be awesome, but I don't know if we're capable yet of that. We might have the processing power, but I don't know if we have the software capability yet to do that. So, um, you know, that's certainly a possibility. How long will it be until microdata is uh, really going to be implemented? I think we got to wait until the spec is done, the HTML5 spec, and I think that's going to be done in like a month or two. I mean, they're, they're saying last call on all the emails I'm getting, so they're going through the last call right now. So basically, if you guys have any problems with the spec, this is the time to complain. Okay, because it's about to be finished, and we're gonna have to wait till HTML6, which, you know, I don't know when that's gonna be finished. So, uh, you know, basically, if you want in, you gotta start like listening in now. Well, it's been a pleasure speaking to you guys. All right, great.